Hello, students, and welcome back to Poly 101, the Government of Canada. Last week, we studied federalism and regionalism in Canadian politics. This week, we continue our exploration of the machinery of Canadian government by beginning a two-week exploration of the Canadian Parliament. Today, we are going to focus on the executive branch, the central agencies, and the federal bureaucracy. Let's get started. The topic this week is the executive branch. On this slide, we see two photos of Queen Elizabeth II with Canadian prime ministers. The first photo from 1951 shows Queen Elizabeth when she was Princess Elizabeth, about a year and a half before she assumed the throne. And pictured with her is her husband, Prince Philip, and also the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, the Honourable Louis Saint Laurent. The other photo, of course, is of the present day Queen Elizabeth II with the current Prime Minister, her 12th Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. What is the relationship between the Queen of England and the Canadian Prime Ministers? Who has the power in the executive branch of Canadian government? What is the relationship between these two important individuals, as well as another important title, the Governor General? We'll explore these topics today as we accomplish four different learning objectives in the lecture. First, we're going to introduce the executive branch in Canada by clarifying the relationship between the Queen, the Governor General, and the Prime Minister. And we're also going to explore some other basic concepts related to executive systems and parliamentary government. These include party discipline and a vote of no confidence. Second, we're going to understand the powers of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet through an exploration of agenda setting, policy making, and the budget process. These are the areas where the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are able to exert their power and authority in the Canadian political system. Third, we're going to introduce the Canadian bureaucracy, and we'll begin to do this by identifying its central agencies as well as their powers. We're also going to explore how the central agencies and the Prime Minister created a bit of a scandal called the SNC-Lavalin affair in 2018 and 2019. This is a topic that some of you will be writing on for your research papers later this term. Fourth, we're going to track the evolution of the Canadian bureaucracy with a focus on its increasing professionalization as well as the tension between public service and politicization. How are we going to maintain a neutrally competent federal bureaucracy without political interference? These are the four objectives today as we explore the Canadian government, especially through the executive branch, the central agencies, and the federal bureaucracy. Let's get started. We begin with an overview of the mandate and expectations for the executive branch in Canadian government. The executive branch shall implement the laws, of course. This is first and foremost, the role and responsibility of executive branches in all governments. The executive branch also will ensure that the public's business is carried out efficiently, accountably, and in accordance with the law. We have already explored the idea of responsible government and ministerial responsibility. And these are elements related to parliamentary government and the idea that, we, that the government shall, through the executive branch, ensure the efficient, accountable, and lawful execution of the law in the public's interest. Also, the executive branch is expected to be nonpartisan at the bureaucratic level. At the end of today's lecture, we'll explore the difficulties in ensuring the nonpartisan nature of the bureaucracy. Overall, the executive branch controls the policy-making process in Canada. This includes agenda setting, budgets, and also the federal, the executive branch determines when the next federal election will be held. 
According to the Constitution, this must occur at least every five years, but the Prime Minister has a great deal of discretion about when to time the next election. The executive branch also oversees the nonpartisan bureaucracy, and the executive branch decides who will take certain positions like federally appointed judges, members of the appointed Senate, members of federal regulatory agencies, and the directors of crown corporations. We'll explore the member will explore federal regulatory agencies and crown corporations in today's lecture, and next week we'll look at the Canadian Senate which many of you will be writing your term papers on or your research papers on this semester. Overall, these are the major responsibilities that the executive branch assumes in Canadian government, and we'll explore many of them in depth today. Let's take a look at figure 9.1 from our Brooks textbook. This is the formal organization of Canadian government. Today, our focus is on the center of this chart. We are going to be looking at the executive, and this of course includes the monarch, the governor general, the prime minister, and the cabinet, as well as the nonpartisan bureaucracy, which includes federal departments, agencies, crown corporations, and more. So our focus once again today is on the executive branch, the middle of figure 9.1. Next week, we'll explore the legislature in more depth, including the House of Commons and the Senate. We've already been discussing at great length this term, the role of the judiciary in Canadian politics, especially its enlarged role after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982 was adopted. And so we see the third branch of Canadian government here is, of course, the judicial branch. But once again, today, our focus is on the executive. The formal executive in Canada is the British monarch, who is, of course, Queen Elizabeth II. When the Queen is not physically present in Canada, her duties are carried out by the Governor General. Here we see a photograph, a recent photograph at that, of Queen Elizabeth II when she was wearing black and a black mask at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in London. And we also see a photo of the most recent, but not current, as we'll explore in a second, Governor General Julie Payette. And so the Queen and the Governor General, they perform mostly symbolic functions. The role of the Queen and the Governor General uh, before Confederation was much larger, of course. But after Confederation, and especially after the finalization of the Canadian Constitution, we have seen the diminishing role of the Crown in Canadian politics. Now, these are mostly symbolic functions that the Queen and the Governor General exercise. This does not mean, however, that they cease to be important figures in Canadian political life. Currently, the office of the Governor General is vacant. This is because former Governor General Julie Payette recently resigned. The resignation was over a supposed toxic workplace that Julie Payette cultivated in the Governor General's office. For now, while the government searches for a new Governor General, the Chief Justice has assumed the position, but apparently in cases like this, when the Chief Justice assumes the vacant position, the role becomes known as Administrator of the Government of Canada. So currently, the Chief Justice pictured here is fulfilling that role that the Governor General would normally fulfill on behalf of Queen Elizabeth II, who is the formal executive in Canada. But once again, these are all mostly symbolic functions. We'll explore the few times where these symbolic functions have become important and in most of these cases where the symbolic crosses over to the practical, we have seen constitutional crises or at least very concerning constitutional affairs uh, result from when the, the crown has exceeded this symbolic authority in more recent years.
So if the British Crown only exercises symbolic authority, who holds the real decision-making power? Of course, it's the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. The real decision-making powers of the executive branch in Canada belong to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister is the leader of the Cabinet. And we can see here the current Cabinet with Justin Trudeau seated in the front and center of this photo, and the rest of the Cabinet. And the Cabinet includes the top ministers and the heads of all of the federal departments. So, of course, there's a Minister of Defense, a Minister of Finance, uh, a leader of the government, a Minister of Portfolio, a Minister of Interior, a Minister of Agriculture. We see these sorts of departments and ministries in executive branches around the world, and Canada is no different. And so the cabinet then is composed of about the top 35 ministers in the government. In Canada, cabinets are always single party cabinets. Canada does not have a history, as we'll explore later, of coalition governments. Instead, what we have seen are single party majority or single party minority cabinets, meaning that cabinet in Canada is formed by the party that receives the most seats, usually a majority, but not always, the most seats in the House of Commons. And so the prime minister then is the leader of the largest party in the House of Commons. And then that largest party will take its top 35 ministers or so, and they'll be appointed to cabinet positions. We'll look at the rationale and the determination of who gets which cabinet seats in just a few slides. The prime minister and the cabinet's powers, which we'll explore today, are established by sections 11 and 13 of the Constitution Act. However, they are also influenced by the constitutional conventions of parliamentary government, which were inherited from the British Westminster style parliament. And so we look then both at the written codified rules in the Constitution Act, as well as the history and conventions of parliamentary government as exercised in the British Parliament, as well as over the last 150 years in Canada after Confederation. The Prime Minister only serves in that position so long as he or she retains the confidence of the House. What is the confidence of the House? It means majority support in the House, either through the maintenance of a majority party, that is to say, a political party that maintains more than half of the seats in the House of Commons, or if the party doesn't have a majority of the seats, it at least needs majority support on all of the bills, that is to say, the laws it's trying to pass. And so how does a prime minister maintain the confidence of the House? Mostly, it comes through something known as party discipline. Party discipline means that members of the governing party will normally support their party's policies. There are exceptions for instance on issues like matters of conscience, but otherwise, if you are a member of the governing party, you are expected to vote in favor of your party's preferred agenda. And so this is what enables the prime minister and the cabinet to move their legislative agenda, to move their preferred policies through the House of Commons without any serious impediment or obstruction. The official opposition has an opportunity to debate and to oppose and to criticize and to question. However, if party discipline is maintained, the opposition will never have enough votes to overrule the majority party. However, if the prime minister loses the support of his or her party or is defeated on a crucial bill such as a budget bill, or a revenue bill, then that can result in what is known as a vote of no confidence. A vote of no confidence is when the House will call all of the members to express either confidence or a lack of confidence in the Prime Minister. 
And if a majority of the House expresses no confidence in the Prime Minister, that triggers a new election, where usually a new Prime Minister is going to be selected by the result of the next election. And so, if the Prime Minister cannot retain the majority support either through their own majority governing party, or if in a minority position, having the majority support on all of their major policy proposals, lacking that, there will be new elections. By convention, at the conclusion of an election, the leader of the party that wins a majority of the seats in the House of Commons will be appointed prime minister and appointed by the governor general. This is, of course, a formality, the appointment. And the true decision here is made by the Canadian people in the election. We are going to explore political parties and electoral systems and electoral system reform in a few weeks. For now, it's sufficient to know that there have been 31 majority governments in Canada. Of the 43 federal elections, 31 of them have resulted in a single political party obtaining more than half of the seats in the House of Commons. What happens when a party fails to win a majority in an election? When no party wins a majority, the party that won the most seats will be given the opportunity to form a government that can try to secure majority support on all of the different policy proposals that they propose and try to pass in the legislature. And Canada has had 12 minority governments out of its 43 elections. And this includes the current Trudeau government, which was elected in the fall of 2019. And so we can see here from this figure that of the total seats in the House of Commons, the 338 seats on which the Canadian people vote in every federal election, you need, or a political party needs 170 of those seats to command a majority. And we can see that represented by a vertical line as the target to reach for a political party to obtain a majority. The Liberal Party won the most seats, 157, but that's not enough for a majority. The combined opposition, that is to say, the Conservative Party with its 121 seats, the Bloc Québécois with its 32 seats, the NDP with its 24 seats, the Green Party's three, and the one independent seat held by Vancouver's Jody Wilson-Raybould, who we will return to later in today's lecture when we talk about the SNC-Lavalin affair, that combined opposition is larger than the governing party. So that means that on any proposal that the liberal government, the minority liberal government is trying to pass, it must obtain a little bit more support, either from the Conservative Party or the Bloc or the NDP, or the Greens, or some combination of these parties, because it needs to get more than 170 votes in order to pass a piece of legislation. But party discipline only guarantees that they'll have 157. And for this reason, minority governments live much shorter lives than majority governments. In general, minority governments in Canada last about two to two and a half years, whereas majority governments can last more than eight years across multiple successful majority election results. We'll finish our introduction to the executive branch by considering prime ministerial government, that is to say the parliamentary system that vests power in a prime minister, and we're going to compare that with presidential power in a presidential system. And the interesting thing and somewhat counterintuitive thing to note here is that the Canadian prime minister can wield more power within Canada than the US president can wield within the United States. Of course, this is a comparison of relative power, the Canadian prime minister relative to other Canadian political actors, 
and not a measure of absolute power because, of course, the United States, with the largest economy and military in the world, has a lot more power at the discretion of President Joseph Biden. But when we look at Joseph Biden's political power compared to the power of the United States Congress, we see that he has more competitors than Justin Trudeau does in the Canadian system. And this is because in presidential systems, there is the principle of separation of powers embedded in the constitutions of these presidencies. And this separation of powers means the executive and legislative powers are independent of each other, held separately, where the president and the Congress must both agree and cooperate in order to make law. We compare this with parliamentary systems where we see the fusion of powers, that is to say, the intermingling and mixture of executive and legislative powers. We're going to explore the Canadian Parliament and legislature in more depth next week. However, we're looking at the flip side of that coin this week because the executive, unlike in presidential systems, the executive in Canada and in parliamentary systems is part of the legislature. The prime minister is just the leader of the largest party in the legislature. And so the prime minister, of course, is the top executive officer of the Canadian government, but is also just another member of parliament. Just like all of the cabinet ministers represent some riding, some small electoral district or portion of Canada, but then they manage a larger portfolio within the cabinet. So the Minister of Finance will represent one part of Canada, but also be responsible for the finance and the budget as we're going to explore. And so this intermingling of executive and legislative power is known as the fusion of powers. And so what this means, as we've already explored the prime minister through party discipline and single party majority cabinets, can very easily pass his or her legislative agenda through the House of Commons. And this is not a guarantee in presidential systems where presidents must often battle against a legislature controlled, at least partially, by an opposition party. So instead of a legislature opposing the prime minister in Canada, the real counterweights to the Canadian prime minister's power are the courts, the media, and larger provinces, not the parliament. And key decisions in Canada are made by the prime minister and a small group of advisors, only some of whom may be cabinet ministers, but as we'll look at, there are about seven to 11 crucially important cabinet ministers in setting the agenda and passing policy in the Canadian system. And we can build on this point by looking at where Canada ranks in terms of 36 democracies and their index of executive dominance. The index of executive dominance is a measure devised by Arend Leipart in his book, Patterns of Democracy, where he studies 36 democracies from 1945 to 2010. And in his chapter on relationships between the executive and legislative branches, he finds that Canada is ranked near the bottom on this chart, meaning that the executive dominates the legislature. Switzerland, with a score of one, has the most balance between its executive and legislative branches. However, at the bottom of this list, we see Canada and the United Kingdom and other countries where the executive is able to dominate the legislative. And so when we compare the United States score of 4.0 with Canada's score of 8.1, we can see quite a difference in executive dominance, meaning that parliamentary systems, and especially the Westminster style parliamentary system adopted by Canada, inherited from the United Kingdom, empowers the prime minister to a great extent. Before we proceed to our next learning objective, let's say a few more words about the powers of the crown, that is to say the monarch and governor general, in relation to the prime minister and cabinet. 
Formally, the Crown must give what's called royal assent or approval to laws that Parliament passes, but this is just a formality. The Crown has no actual role in policy making or setting the policy agenda, and it automatically grants its royal assent to any law that Parliament might pass. Under the conventions of parliamentary government, the Governor General must agree to the Prime Minister's request to dissolve Parliament for an election. What does this mean? As I said earlier, the Prime Minister has the discretion to call a new election. That is to say, an election must occur at least every five years, but the Prime Minister has complete flexibility as to when to schedule that election. And Typically, if the Prime Minister requests to dissolve the Parliament and call a new election, the Prime Minister gets that request granted, basically automatically, by the Governor General. Does the Governor General, does the Queen, does the Crown, in other words, have any discretion in these sorts of decisions? Not really. And when it exercises them, they become quite controversial. The last time that the Governor General refused a Prime Minister's request for an election was in 1926, and this was known as the King Bing Affair, and it amounted to a constitutional crisis where Prime Minister Mackenzie King's request for an election was denied by Lord Bing, leading to a very brief opposition government that then fell, leading to the return of Mackenzie King. You can read more about this in chapter 10 of our textbook. More recently, in December of 2008, shortly after I moved to Canada, the Governor General granted Prime Minister Stephen Harper's request for something known as prorogation, which was an ability of his to essentially skirt or avoid a vote of no confidence that the combined opposition was going to hold. The Liberal Party, the Bloc Québécois and the NDP would have had the votes to express their lack of confidence in the Prime Minister, who had just been re-elected to a minority government months previously. And so instead of holding this vote of no confidence, the Prime Minister requested to prorogue the Parliament, and the Governor General granted that request. If the Governor General had not granted this request, then there might have been one of the first coalition governments in peacetime in Canadian history. To learn more about these issues, once again, turn to the textbook. But typically, the, the Crown does not have actual discretion in when the Prime Minister might call an election or, in some cases, avoid one. And when it happens, the issue is quite memorable indeed. For our second learning objective, we are going to explore the powers of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. We begin with the policymaking process. As we just said, the Crown has no role in the policymaking process, and so the Prime Minister and Cabinet are at the center of it. One of the Prime Minister's first duties after securing the leadership and securing the election result of a majority government, or in some cases, a minority government, one of the first duties then for the prime minister is to select his or her cabinet members, that is to say cabinet ministers, who are members of the House of Commons. And so Justin Trudeau will search his liberal party for 35 cabinet ministers, or Stephen Harper's conservative governments before that, both majority and minority governments, would search for conservative members within their own government to fill these ministry positions. And so each federal ministry has its own ministry head, and that is the cabinet member. So how does the prime minister select individuals, select these members? Which members of the House get selected to fill cabinet positions? Of course, important political calculations go into these decisions. And of course, the notion that the cabinet should represent fairly evenly the different regions and provinces 
as well as have francophone representation, and every prime minister has to be at least minimally competent in French and English. Usually the business community is going to be given a role within the cabinet, but also spokespersons for other economic interests, such as agriculture or labor, are going to be included in the cabinet. And so the prime minister must balance all of these different interests within the cabinet and make sure that each of them have some form of representation. Next week, we're going to look my apologies for the technical glitch on the last slide. It prevented me from making the final point, which was that while representation goes into the political calculations of who becomes a cabinet minister, this is really just representation of the regions, the Francophone community, the business and labor communities. Only until recently have women and visible minorities been included in the cabinet in a much more significant way than in the past. And we're going to explore that next week when we look at the legislature and women's representation in Canada. For this week, let's look now at how the cabinet and the prime minister influence agenda setting. Agenda setting is a crucial part of the decision-making process in government. And that's because agenda setting places the important issues that the government wants to pursue on the public's radar. It makes them salient issues in the public mind. And so the government will identify policy problems and then identify policy solutions in the form of legislation that it seeks to pass through the House of Commons. And it is the prime minister and the cabinet that get to decide what is at the top of the policy agenda. Government is so complex and modern life is so complex and the range of issues that government can act on is so vast that which topics will government pursue? Of course, it's within the discretion of the prime minister and cabinet to make that determination. And usually we can identify what the top priorities are for the government because with each new session of parliament, there is a speech from the throne. And this is one of the main ways that the Prime Minister and Cabinet announce their policy priorities and set the legislative agenda. So with the beginning of each new Parliament, the speech from the throne lets the public know what the Prime Minister and Cabinet will seek to do with their political capital. In Justin Trudeau's government, the Cabinet Committee on Agenda results and communications is the center of cabinet decision-making and agenda setting. This has changed the name of the different committees within the cabinet responsible for agenda setting have changed over the years. And you can read about that in chapter 10 of our textbook. But the most recent incarnation of these crucial agenda setting committees within the cabinet is Trudeau's Cabinet Committee on Agenda, Results, and Communications. And what you can see here are the seven members of that committee. And by the way, we should add to this the members of the Treasury Board, which would add an additional three cabinet ministers to this list. But essentially, these seven to ten cabinet ministers are the most important for setting the agenda of the government which will then lead to the policies that the government seeks to pass. And so we see here, of course, the prime minister, as well as the deputy prime minister who doubles as the minister of finance, the Honorable Christ, uh, Krista Freeland. And we also see a collection of other cabinet ministers. And what you'll notice if you look at where they're from is you see that even geographic spread in terms of their representation, where we see two cabinet ministers from Quebec representing the Francophone population, but then we also see cabinet ministers from across the West and Ontario. And so we see then that regional representation within this crucial committee within cabinet is a very important determination of who is appointed and then who has outsized control because you're looking here at seven of the most important individuals in the executive branch for determining the priorities of Canadian government and the policy responses to them. 
Prime Minister and Cabinet also define the policy agenda through the annual budget process. Every winter, the Minister of Finance, who we just saw pictured on the previous slide, begins consideration of the budget. The technical term for this is tables the budget by introducing the government's estimates in the House of Commons. This comes in the form of the expenditure budget estimate. And the expenditure budget is the government's spending plans for the forthcoming fiscal year. And the fiscal year runs from April 1st to the end of March. And so we are now at the near the end of the current fiscal year. And so we can look at the 2020 to 2021 expenditure budget for information on the most recent budget passed by the government. And we can look at current estimates for the 2021-2022 year. And what we can notice when we compare different budgets is how there are shifts in spending priorities, which usually reflect changes in government as well as public priorities. And so the biggest changes, of course, come from switches between governments, where a conservative government might value funding certain priorities, a, an incoming liberal government will usually change those and vice versa. Or perhaps an external shock, like say a global pandemic, might change spending priorities drastically from one year to the next as well. In addition to the yearly budget, every few years, the Minister of Finance also presents in Parliament what's known as a revenue budget or economic statement, which outlines the government's long-term forecast for the economy. So both through annual budget process and long-term budget forecasts, the government through the prime minister and cabinet can set the agenda by providing budget estimates, which of course shapes the rest of the policy process for the year because spending and allocation is a crucial part of the responsibility of the executive branch. We've looked at the most important members of the cabinet from the perspective of agenda setting and policy making, but exactly how powerful is the cabinet, especially in relation to the power of the prime minister? Cabinet ministers are influential, but only to the degree that the prime minister allows them to be influential and to the degree that the Prime Minister supports their favored projects and initiatives. Yes, the Cabinet is important, but in Canada, the Prime Minister is the true seat of power within the executive branch. This isn't as true in the countries that we saw previously on the slide that had the graph, or rather the table, of the index of executive dominance. Countries like Switzerland and Israel which have a legislative executive balance, have a nearly equal relationship between prime minister and top cabinet ministers. But in countries with a high index of executive dominance, like Canada, the United Kingdom, and Spain, and especially Botswana, we see a domination of the executive over the legislative. And that includes a relationship between the prime minister and cabinet where the prime minister has the most authority and the most power, and the cabinet members might as well just be regular members of the House. This, of course, is somewhat of an exaggeration, but illustrates the point that it's all up to the discretion of the prime minister how much power the cabinet might have. The decision-making process in cabinet, yes, it occurs in formal committee meetings and also in informal conversations. But in both of these contexts, the prime minister is the dominant player. Of course, another factor affecting a cabinet minister's status is overseeing a powerful part of the bureaucracy. Not all parts of the bureaucracy are created equal. And the minister of finance is, of course, going to have an outsized impact. The minister of defense will have an outsized impact. And so there are important positions within the cabinet and then we can identify certain members within the cabinet that have more power than others. Although cabinet members are never really involved in the day-to-day -day running of their departments, still having an important portfolio is then a, a marker of status and prestige for the more high-ranking cabinet members. However, 
policy initiatives are more likely to be generated within the bureaucracy, within the nonpartisan bureaucracy. It's not just the heads of these bureaucratic departments or ministries, but rather the rank and file, the career civil service, the public sector employees, they're the ones generating the day-to-day -day policy initiatives. And the heads of these ministries, the cabinet members, they're not always aware of the day-to-day -day operations. And this is natural because as we'll explore later, government has grown increasingly complex over the 20th century history of Canada and into the 21st century. And so it's very important then to explore the role, structure, and evolution of the Canadian bureaucracy. And that's something we're going to turn our attention to next. Given the increased complexity and the increased workload of modern governments, the cabinet must receive support from the central agencies of the Canadian bureaucracy. The central agencies have a primary purpose to support the decision-making powers and activities of the cabinet. And this includes supplying information to the parliament and to the cabinet, as well as communicating with the public. The central agency's influence then rests on their involvement in cabinet decision making. We're going to explore four of the central agencies today. The Department of Finance, the Privy Council Office, the Treasury Board Secretariat, and the Prime Minister's Office. We'll also see how three of these four central agencies were implicated in the unethical behavior surrounding the SNC-Lavalin affair. As noted earlier, the Prime Minister and Cabinet have the power to set the agenda through the annual budget process. And of course, the Minister of Finance, as the head of the Finance Ministry, has a crucial role in this. But of course, the Minister of Finance can't do this job alone, and so the central agency known as the Department of Finance assists the Minister of Finance and has exclusive or at least nearly exclusive authority over the preparation of the revenue budget, budget speeches, and any economic statements delivered in Parliament by the Finance Minister. The Department of Finance generates much of the new initiatives in taxation and trade policy in Canada. It also manages the level of government spending and debt. Will the government run a budget surplus or a budget deficit? This is a determination based on the priorities of the Department of Finance and the annual budget estimates that it provides. And so through this, it's able then, as I noted earlier, to influence the entire spectrum of government policy through its role in the annual formulation of the expenditure budget. Whatever the government can do in a given year is, of course, going to be constrained or facilitated by the spending priorities and the allocation of the government revenues in this form of spending. And so the Department of Finance then, in the way that it informs and supplies with information, the finance minister has a crucial role in the financial and budgetary process of the executive branch. We move from finance and the budget to the policy making process and the Privy Council Office. The Privy Council Office is the principal source of policy advice to the Prime Minister. The PCO, or Privy Council Office, is headed by the Chief Clerk, who is the top bureaucrat in the Canadian government, and who reports directly to the Prime Minister. The Privy Council Office briefs the Prime Minister on the selection of deputy ministers, on federal provincial relations and on all issues of governmental organization and ministerial mandates. The Prime Minister has so much responsibility within the Canadian government that to be kept abreast of it of course requires an extensive bureaucracy and in this case the central agency of the Privy Council Office assists the Prime Minister and the Cabinet with the policy making process by providing all of this information. It also provides support services for the cabinet committees, 
such as scheduling and keeping the minutes of committee meetings, and also provides policy advice as well as on how to deal with government departments. We will see, though, that the Privy Council Office and the Department of Finance were implicated in the SNC-Lavalin affair that we'll talk about momentarily. First, let's talk about the Treasury Board Secretariat. In addition to the committee I discussed earlier with the seven cabinet ministers who have the most power over agenda setting, we also have the Treasury Board Secretariat, which we could add in to those seven ministers and say that they're probably the most important cabinet ministers. However, those ministers who make up the Treasury Board Secretariat also need extensive support from this central agency, the Treasury Board Secretariat. And so the Treasury Board Secretariat exists to negotiate with public sector unions and it establishes rules for hiring public servants. And this is important because as we'll see, there are so many public servants in Canada. About one in four individuals with a job works in the public sector. Also, the Treasury Board Secretariat helps to implement policies within the public service and formulates the departmental expenditure forecast used by cabinet to make decisions on the allocation of financial resources among competing programs. It also prepares the annual spending estimates that are tabled in Parliament and monitors department spending. And so we can see here that the Treasury Board Secretariat is closely related to the Department of Finance and indeed the Minister of Finance sits on both. The last central agency that we'll explore is the Prime Minister's Office, otherwise known as the PMO. The PMO is the most partisan of the central agencies, and this is because it's staffed chiefly, primarily, by partisan appointees and not career public servants. Bureaucracies and democracies are typically staffed by a mixture of career civil servants, that is to say, nonpartisan bureaucrats who work in central agencies and other bureaucracies just as a matter of their career. Other positions within the bureaucracies are filled by political appointees. These are individuals who are appointed by the government of the day and then replaced by the incoming or future governments. In some countries, there's a relatively even split within the bureaucracies. In Canada, however, most of the central agencies and bureaucracies are nonpartisan, but the increasing politicization of the bureaucracy, especially with the SNC-Lavalin affair that we'll explore next, is an issue in contemporary Canadian politics and indeed has been an issue for the last century plus. So, we see then that the PMO has the most political appointees and PMO officials are the prime minister's personal staff and they perform functions that range from handling his or her correspondence and schedule to speech writing, media relations, liaising with ministers, the caucus and the party, providing political advice on appointments and policy and prepping the prime minister for question period, which is the period during which the prime minister must stand before the House of Commons and accept questions from the opposition. A criticism of the politicization and the dominance of political appointees within the PMO is that persons who are not elected to the office and who are not part of the public service may appear to have an exceptional influence on the prime minister and the direction of government policy. And also when the prime minister's office is used to pressure other cabinet ministers, as we'll see in a second, this can also create controversy. And so then the four central agencies we've discussed have a mixture of political appointees, especially in the prime minister's office, as well as career civil servants in the other three of these four central agencies. But the concern of politicization and inappropriate influence on government policy is something we turn our attention to now. The SNC-Lavalin affair is one of the political scandals that you can choose if you selected the research paper topic on political scandals. 
And this was the most recent of the political scandals that you can write on. And it involved the prime minister, the central agencies, the attorney general of Canada, and Canada's largest construction firm, which is called SNC-Lavalin. SNC-Lavalin allegedly funneled millions of dollars to government officials in Libya to obtain preferential treatment and contracts for construction there. In early 2019, the former cabinet member and attorney general within the Liberal government, Jody Wilson-Raybould, resigned from the Trudeau government and then quit the Liberal Party after the Prime Minister and members of the Prime Minister's office, the Privy Council office, and the Department of Finance exerted unethical and inappropriate pressure on her for four months to change her decision regarding prosecuting SNC-Lavalin. The Prime Minister and the rest of the Cabinet wished for SNC-Lavalin to be given something called a Deferred Prosecution Agreement. And this would have allowed if the Attorney General, who was also a Liberal Cabinet Minister, Jody Wilson-Raybould, if she had approved of the Deferred Prosecution Agreement, it would have enabled SNC-Lavalin to avoid the most serious criminal punishments and would have also allowed SNC-Lavalin to continue taking government contracts. As Canada's largest construction firm and also a very important French-Canadian business, it had a lot of importance for the Prime Minister's government as well as the province that he represents, or at least he represents a district within the province of Quebec. And so Justin Trudeau's government had an interest in protecting SNC-Lavalin. However, the Attorney General, who is supposed to make decisions not on a partisan basis, but in accordance with the pursuit of justice, decided that prosecution was the way to go. And for months, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's personal secretary within the PMO, the Department of Finance and the Privy Council Office and the Chief Clerk within the Privy Council Office all attempted to exert political, inappropriate political interference over the Attorney General's decision. And the Attorney General is supposed to have the discretion to prosecute or not prosecute. And then that determination is not supposed to be influenced by partisanship or by political considerations. And so, as a result of Jody Wilson-Raybould's decision, she was shuffled out of the position of Attorney General. Then she resigned, testified before the House of Commons about what had happened, and then an ethics report condemning the behavior of the Trudeau government during this crisis was released before the last federal election. And yet the Trudeau government did not lose that election. Nonetheless, the scandal highlighted the conflicting and sometimes ambiguous rules regarding cabinet solidarity and the role of the attorney general, because the attorney general, as a minister of justice, is part of the cabinet. But the usual rules of cabinet solidarity and party discipline, which are supposed to bind the cabinet together behind the prime minister, this doesn't always necessarily apply when matters of justice and the role of the attorney general is involved. And so if you want to write on political scandals and you choose this scandal, then when you consider institutional reforms that would be necessary in the future, you would consider issues like the independence of the central agencies, the politicization of the prime minister's office, and the role of the attorney general within the cabinet. Let's move beyond the central agencies so we can talk more broadly about the structure of Canadian bureaucracy, as well as the astonishing number of employees, at least as a share of the Canadian population, that works for the public sector. The federal public sector employs about 530,000 people. This is at the federal level, working in around 400 different federal organizations. Just over 50% of this total work directly for government departments and agencies. 
whereas another 20% are employed by crown corporations, which we'll define momentarily. The rest of this number work in the Canadian Forces, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and other federal agencies. If we look at public sector employment at the provincial, territorial, and local or municipal levels, the number rises substantially. Public sector employment there is roughly a million people, but balloons to three million if you include hospitals, healthcare facilities, schools, and enterprises owned by these different territorial, provincial, or local levels of government. And so then if we take the highest estimate here, we have over three and a half million, nearly four million public sector employees in Canada, about one out of every four working Canadians is employed in one of these public sector positions. And we can see here that just between the years 2003 and 2013, Canada's public sector grew by over 22% adding over half a million public sector jobs in that period of time. And so as we'll explore near the conclusion of today's lecture, the Canadian government and the federal bureaucracy continues to grow despite some criticisms that it's too large. So the public sector, which is known as the bureaucracy, can be divided then into three main components. We have the public service, agencies and tribunals, and crown corporations. Now, in the fine print of this slide, you can see that these three categories do not cover the entire federal bureaucracy. There is more to the bureaucracy than this. But I'm sure a lecture on bureaucracy that is going to run between an hour and 10 to an hour and 30 minutes is enough of a challenge for you to sit through already. So I won't subject you to the entire array of Canadian federal bureaucracy, and instead we'll limit it to these three. However, if we were so inclined, we could in expand our analysis to look at the Auditor General's Office, the Commissioner of Official Languages, the RCMP, and the Canadian Armed Forces. Together, all of these different parts of the bureaucracy perform many different functions in Canadian government. For instance, it is, this includes the provision and administration of services to the public, as well as to other parts of the bureaucracy, the integration of policy in a particular policy field, policy advice, giving policy advice and information and expertise to ministers, the development and administration of regulations, whether regulations over environmental subjects such as emissions or regulations over businesses and finance and securities, as well as the disbursement of funds such as cultural grants. And so this is just to name a few of the functions that bureaucracy serves. So we'll explore these three major types, the public service, agencies and tribunals, and crown corporations in the next slides. We start with the public service. This is where about half of the federal public sector employees work. And the public service includes all the statutory departments and all of the other organizations whose members are appointed by the Public Service Commission. And also this includes members of the Treasury Board, employees of the Treasury Board. The Public Service Commission is nonpartisan, and it exists to protect the merit-based hiring within the federal service, as well as bilingualism within the federal service. Despite the nonpartisan nature, what we see is that the federal public service is the part of the bureaucracy that is most directly under the authority and direction of the cabinet and the prime minister. Moving forward to agencies and tribunals, we see that these perform a wide variety of regulatory, research, and advisory functions. These include such regulatory bodies as the National Transportation Agency, 
and what we'll focus on here, the National Energy Board, which is now known as the Canada Energy Regulator. And these are responsible for regulating oil and gas pipelines in the Canadian public interest. So those of you who are writing your research papers on pipelines and pipeline politics, you should look at the National Energy Board, now the Canada Energy Regulator, because they're responsible for conducting social, environmental studies on the effects of pipelines. And so if you want to supplement your research for your pipeline paper, check out the National Energy Board, otherwise known as the Canada Energy Regulator. Regardless of which agency or tribunal we look at, they tend to have a greater degree of independence from the government than does the public service. Now we look at Crown Corporations. Crown Corporations in most cases perform commercial functions and typically operate at arm's length from the government of the day. They hire their own employees, control their own internal administrative structures, and in many cases operate like private businesses. This is especially true for the profit-making Crown Corporations, which have much more autonomy and don't actually have to submit an operating budget to the government every year, like the Crown Corporations that are fully funded by the government, which there are some, they must submit an operating budget. But those that make a profit are exempt from this obligation. And so Crown Corporations run the gamut then, from being publicly financed to operating like a private business and generating profits. And so examples abound, including the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Export Development Canada, the Farm Credit Corporation, and Via Rail, the Canada Rail Service. As we move on to our fourth and final learning objective for today's lecture, I'm sure your head is spinning a bit. So far, we've covered four central agencies and three other components of the federal bureaucracy. And all of this adds up to a lot of federal government, and a whole lot of executive branch activity. If you're having a difficult time keeping it all straight, that's okay. It's totally understandable because the Canadian government is pretty large and it's been growing steadily since Confederation. We're going to look at the evolution of the Canadian bureaucracy, both in terms of its overall growth in size and its future growth as well as the professionalization along the way and the freedom of public sector employees to either participate in politics or to stay nonpartisan and how the courts have gotten involved in that dispute. But let's just begin with the growth of Canadian government and the growth of the Canadian bureaucracy. At the beginning of Confederation, the federal government didn't spend a lot of money, about $14 million annually, it operated only 10 major departments and by 1900 employed all of 12,000 people. By 1960, 60 years later, the federal government spent 5.7 billion annually, operated 92 major departments and agencies and employed about 200,000 people, which has increased today to a $360 billion annual budget hundreds of departments and agencies, and nearly 300,000 people employed at that level. Of course, we know that the public sector bureaucracy extends much more expansively at the provincial, territorial, and municipal level. And so we see here a clear trend in the growth of the public sector and the Canadian bureaucracy. At the same time, we've seen changes to the hiring practices, as we'll explore next. And this is because the public service is now hired and promoted on the basis of merit. The Canadian bureaucracy is a meritocracy, like most professional bureaucracies in the world today. However, when Canada became independent, this was not typically true of bureaucracies. Bureaucracies used to be a patronage system 
in the 19th century in Canada and also in the United States and in other places, the public service positions were filled not on the basis of merit, that is to say experience and education and ability and performance, but rather on the basis of patronage, which is to say it was normal for the government and the government party to take care of their friends and their party loyalists by appointing them to all of the government jobs that they now had control over by virtue of their electoral victory. Government contracts were awarded on the basis of political favoritism in those days, but because of important reforms that we're going to cover, today laws and staffing rules limit the possibility of such practices occurring. We know that the Prime Minister's office still has a great degree of politicization through the appointment of a large number of people and a shortage of career civil servants in the Prime Minister's office. But elsewhere in the bureaucracy, merit is how people get hired. And the merit principle is simply that hiring and promotion decisions are to be based on relevant qualifications experience, academic degrees, professional credentials, and certification. And this came into effect because of the Civil Service Amendment Act and the Civil Service Act, which were passed in the early 20th century and introduced this merit principle for hiring and the promotion of public servants. And it also created what we now know as the Public Service Commission. And so this brought Canada in line with the modern ideal, the 20th century ideal for bureaucracy, which is that it should be characterized by neutral competence. That is to say, a bureaucracy should be neutral in the sense that it is nonpartisan and independent of the political ideology of the government of the day, and also competent, which is to say, hired on the basis of its ability to perform its job not on the basis of patronage and favoritism. Closely related to this, our textbook discusses the politics administration dichotomy. And this is the notion that bureaucrats should be able to serve whichever party is in power, uninfluenced by their own personal preferences. You can imagine that this would be difficult if you believe strongly in a certain political cause but your job makes you work for someone who represents the opposite political view from yours, that can be a test of your ability to be neutral and objective in the delivery of your job and the responsibilities associated with it as a public sector employee or bureaucrat. And so strict limits were originally placed on the rights of public servants to participate in politics other than voting if you worked in the public service, there wasn't much you could do to participate in the Canadian democracy. They could not contribute money to a candidate or a political party. They could not publicly express support for a candidate or a party, for example, by posting a sign on their property or making a speech in public. These rules, which originally were quite strict, were relaxed somewhat in 1967 with the passage of the Public Service Employment Act. Because of this act, attending political meetings and making political contributions, these were taken off of the prohibited activities list. The Public Service Commission was empowered to grant unpaid leaves of absences of absence to public servants running for office. And so if a public servant wanted to get into politics, they were given a leave of absence where they could leave their bureaucratic job, run for political office, campaign, make political speeches, and if they lost that election, they could come back after a leave of absence to their bureaucratic job, or if they won, they could formally resign and take political office. However, these relaxations didn't seem quite sufficient after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982 entrenched individual liberties in the Canadian Constitution. We know that as a result of the Charter, the courts gained a lot of power to interpret the Constitution, especially in the defense of Charter rights. And so 
how would the rights of public sector employees stack up with the new protection of individual liberties and political participation and fundamental freedoms that we know are all parts of the charter? So how did the courts respond in the post-charter period to the prohibition on political participation and activities by public sector employees? This question is all the more important because as we know, the public sector continues to grow. And with one in four jobs in Canada being in the public sector, if we start to ban this group of people from public participation, that's a large component of people who are not allowed to participate politically in the same way as those employed in the private sector. Let's look at two important court decisions on this topic. First, we have Fraser v. PSSRB, a 1985 decision. In this case, a public servant named Neil Fraser was fired after he publicly and severely attacked the Trudeau government. This was the Pierre Trudeau government, Justin's father. He attacked the Trudeau government for adopting the metric system and for introducing the Charter of Rights that we just discussed. The Supreme Court ruled that Fraser had actually crossed the line from non-job related to job related criticism. And public servants owed their loyalty to the government, not the party that happens to be in power. So in this case, the court ruled in favor of the prohibitions on political participation, in this case, criticism of the government, and against the ability of individuals employed in the public sector to participate. However, in Osborne v. Canada, that is to say the Treasury Board, Osborne and other public servants argued in court that public service employment, or rather that the Public Service Employment Act's ban on public servants working for or against political candidates violated their charter rights to freedom of speech and freedom of association. Public sector employees believe that they had these fundamental rights, even if it was tied to making statements for political candidates for or against. The Supreme Court agreed with this. The ban was over-inclusive and it went beyond what was necessary to achieve the objective of an impartial and loyal public service. Remember, the Supreme Court, it asks a couple of different questions, a means test and an ends test. And in this case, what is the end of the legislation? Well, it's to create an impartial and loyal public service. How can we achieve that? And can we achieve that short of banning these individuals from being able to campaign for or against a candidate? The Supreme Court decided that public sector employees should have at least this right. And so we can see here that there is a battle in the courts to be waged over the ability of bureaucrats to be politically active. And so the politicization of the bureaucracy and the nonpartisan public service of the bureaucracy, we see a tension between these that the courts has helped resolve. We conclude with some notes about the size of the Canadian government. Since the 1970s, we've entered an era of diminished expectations for the state. Between 1984 and 1977, the percentage of Canadians who agreed that government wastes a good deal of money ranged from about 46 to 80 percent. This then is interpreted as an expression of discontent with the size and spending of government. However, at the same time, government spending hasn't gone down. After 1997, the Canadian government started, spend, uh, started running budget surpluses, not because it cut its spending, but because of economic growth for Canada. And so Canada has not reduced its spending after this period, even though for decades now, many Canadians feel that the government spends too much. But we, but we see that at the same time, the New Democrat Party, which we'll study in a few weeks, labor unions, the environmental movement, many social scientists and intellectuals and many others, they still look to the Canadian state as the necessary instrument for promoting things like social justice, 
environmental protection, and economic prosperity. And so government in Canada has not been significantly downsized despite criticisms. Like I keep saying, about one in four of all workers are employed either directly or indirectly by the state. Human rights codes, pay equity rulings, environmental laws and regulatory bodies, these have all made the state more, not less intrusive in recent decades. And so as the Canadian state continues to grow, the importance of understanding the executive branch from the Queen of England to the Governor General, to the Prime Minister, to the Cabinet, to the central agencies, and to all of the other parts of the growing federal, provincial, territorial, and local bureaucracies, we need to understand all of these issues because if the government continues to grow, we should continue to keep our eyes on it. Let's talk about our lecture reflection assignment. This week, our lecture reflection is closely tied to the discussion group worksheet. In discussion groups, we're going to learn how to access five different Canadian political science journals and high quality news magazines. In doing so, we're going to look at some different articles related to the research paper topics. Your job for the lecture reflection is to find two new articles, that is to say articles we haven't already looked at in discussion group. And these two articles should be on the topic that you selected for your research paper. And what you're going to do at the end of the week is submit a document containing the full citation for both of the articles that you've picked on your topic. And you're also going to provide a five sentence description of each article, so 10 sentences overall. Now, what form should this description take? It's really up to you. The description can take the form of summary. It can be a reflection. It can be a commentary, a criticism. I'm just looking for you to engage with two sources in preparation for the research paper that we'll be submitting near the end of the month. And so we're going to continue to work in stages on this assignment to help break it up into manageable portions for you. Remember, as always, please use your own words in submitting this assignment and practice careful paraphrasing. Submit the response and turn it in in the normal way. Next week, what's on tap? The legislative branch. We complete our understanding of the machinery of Canadian government by looking at the legislative branch its relation to the executive that we discussed today, and we'll also have a special focus on women's representation in government. Until then, be safe, be well, be kind, and I'll talk to you soon.